You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Larry Morgan. Larry Morgan is a staff scientist at the Green Bank Observatory. He completed his PhD in astrophysics from the University of Kent in 2006 and focuses on studying star formation in the Milky Way with a specific focus on the study of high-mass stars as well as gas and dust in the interstellar medium. Dr. Larry Morgan, welcome to the program. Hi, it's good to be on. Now, Doctor, you are at the Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia, the dead zone, where radio is strongly controlled, and I assume you can't even use cell phones, is that right? That's right. I mean, there's no signal to be had. I mean, I I have a cell phone that I carry around for the uses of taking pictures, listening to music, podcasts, and so on. Yeah, I, I don't receive any signal, and it's sort of unusable in that general way in terms of making calls or receiving internet. You're not allowed to get too close to the telescope with that because even the the ambient interference can cause problems. So even if you walk near the telescope, you could reflect radio waves into it and that's detectable? Yeah, the, the statistic, well, I guess the, the number that we, that we bandy around the business center here is that we can pick up a regular cell phone in airplane mode on Saturn. So standing anywhere near the telescope with a digital camera or a a cell phone is a pretty loud uh, signal interfering with what we're trying to look at. We live on a planet that is blasting radio (laughs) uh, constantly. So what about interference? If you can't hear inside the valley and everything's suppressed there, what do you hear from outside it? Well, the one thing we really can't do too much about are satellites. Um, you know, satellite radio, satellites that we sometimes find hard to identify due to military uses or you know, things like that. Generally speaking, we do not have line of sight to any cell phone towers, though they would very much like to get closer and closer to us. We, um, When someone does want to set up something like that, they coordinate with the observatory and try and get that set up so that they are pointed away from us. We tend to pick up all kinds of things. Uh, there are people around who may have Wi-Fi in their houses. For example, the places like the doctor's surgery here may not be able to operate without Wi-Fi, so they, they have an agreement with the telescope. They, they have a, a network there. There are certain things like the fire alarm system at the local school that we see. It, electric fences can be a problem for us if, if they're not maintained pretty well. And increasingly these days, you know, we see things like car radar, um, if a, a more modern car drives by. Do you ever see anything weird like ionosphere effects where it can reflect AM radio station into areas where it normally wouldn't? Do you ever see like transient stuff like that? We certainly see transient things. The problem with those is that they are transient and therefore we don't always pin down exactly where they're coming from. It's actually, you know, I, I listened to an episode of your podcast recently with Dunk Lorimer talking about fast radio bursts, you know, some, something like that. We may see something just like that, that is actually a, a transient source of radio frequency interference. And if we just see it the one time, or certainly if it's very short lived, um, that could just pass into our data archive without ever really being truly examined. With interest in fast radio bursts and like, the identification of phenomena like that, that there's suddenly more interest in digging back through the archive and looking for those types of things. And, and these days, we actually spend more and more of our time performing radio frequency interference scans so that we can identify uh, things that may pop up sporadically or randomly and try and pinpoint where they may, may be coming from. Sometimes it's our own equipment, or sometimes there'll be a, a signal and we'll never see it again. Um, there's a group of people here you know, working on that all the time. Now, with fast radio bursts and looking for them in past data now, does the telescope like archive data 24-7 and has since whenever? 24-7 is, you know, a bit of an exaggeration. We 
we don't observe 24 seven, we have maintenance periods and, and there are, we actually have more maintenance period periods during the summer and we'll actually be coming to a close of our summer season soon for that. We, we paint the telescope every year, or at least we did pre pandemic, try have to avoid metal fatigue and so on. We have generally tried to archive all data ever taken by the telescope, certainly for any scientific purposes. That archive is a work in progress. And generally speaking, the, the older the data, the harder it might be to get hold of. We're here to help anyone who, who would try and be looking for anything in that data, those data. Yeah, considering the, what is the estimate on fast radio bursts? There's just a huge amount of them per day that we miss, right? Yeah, and um, I mean, with the GBT, this is why Chime is, is, is such a useful instrument for those because it, it can observe such a large portion of the sky at one time. With the GBT, the, the actual portion of the sky you're looking at is very, very small. So you'd have to be pretty lucky to accidentally pick up anything like that. The Greenback Telescope, speaking mm-hmm. of metal fatigue, and when I was a young teenage amateur astronomer, it collapsed. Mm-hmm. And a new telescope, the current one, was built. Now, what is the distinction between those two telescopes? Meaning, did we build a better telescope after the collapse? Well, absolutely, yeah. I can't speak too much to the... So it, the, the telescope prior to the GBT was the 300-foot telescope. And uh, no, I, I just want to check this. I don't want to say anything that oh, I might be not fully correct on. The 300-foot 300 tele, 300 telescope was, came online in 1962. Now, what I think I'm trying to say is that it was a transit telescope, yes. So, so it did not... It could not just observe any point in the sky. It could not track objects across the sky. So the GBT itself is a vast improvement on that in that we can, you can point at a source that's rising above the horizon and then track that for 12 hours or however long it takes to reach the other horizon and be collecting data that entire time. That was not the case with the 300 foot. So this telescope, what we have now is fully steerable. And as I recall, it's the largest fully steerable telescope on Earth, right? That's correct, yeah. As compared to, I mean, we have bigger ones, the huge telescope in China, for example, but it's not steerable. Oh. It's, it, it's, it works on a different principle. Yeah, of course, I think, I think at the time, the, the, the uh, qualifier of fully steerable was there to distinguish it from Arecibo, which was bigger, but of course, yeah, it couldn't be steered. And how fast is it's taken over in that case. There's also the Effelsberg telescope in Germany, which is fully steerable, but because Green Bank telescope dish is parabolic, we actually beat them out just by a little, a small amount. Now you study high mass stars as, as your base. What can you do in radio astronomy to study high mass stars and star formation? Yeah. So the majority of my work is in, is in the formation period of, of those stars. So What's interesting with high mass stars is that there's there's a lot going on in these stellar nurseries that a lot of people will be familiar with more perhaps in, in terms of molecular clouds and so on, like the Orion Nebula and so on. What my particular emphasis is, is on looking at the, the particular gases and dust that make up those molecular clouds and how they're interacting and behaving in these shrouded regions and what's really interesting with the radio and and longer wavelengths is is that in the optical wavelengths um and to a certain extent the infrared wavelengths you're blocked from seeing really into the depths of those clouds where the the formation is actually occurring um radio waves certainly the longer the wave radio wave the, the, the easier that that radiation passes through that material and you're able to see right into the cores there but there's a lot of interesting chemistry happening and um, a lot of interesting processes. Um, for example, it's still an ongoing debate what exactly the effects of turbulence versus magnetic fields are in these cores. And by observing radio waves emitted by molecules such as ammonia or carbon monoxide and many others, we can determine perhaps exactly what those contributions are. What does the exact moment of the birth of a star look like? For example, the moment that fusion kicks off in one of these star forming regions, does the star just suddenly light up and there it is? Or does the star, is it a more longer process? Well, I, I wish I could give you a definitive answer to that. 
there are there are a, a bunch of steps along the way, and we're able to identify those. For example, there are methanol mazes, which are generally held to be in certain transitions um, indicators of high mass star formation, and they work like any other maser or laser where uh, we have a population inversion of the molecules, which gives our very bright radiation along our line of sight. And what's really interesting about those is recently we, we believe that we found several of these which vary in strength and sometimes in a, in a periodic way. By some interpretations, that, that means that we're, we're actually seeing material falling onto those central stars that are just beginning to form and that the fusion may have actually begun there, but that it's, you know, it's still building up to that full explosion. Now, when fusion really kicks off, then that, that star will ionize the region around itself pretty rapidly. By pretty rapidly, I mean 10,000 years or so, where the, the amount of photons given off in, in that initial eruption, for lack of a better word, um, it fully ionizes all the material around it. And you form what's called an H2 region, where the H2 means ionized hydrogen. That forms what a lot of people call a bubble. And that's actually one of my major fields of study, where these bubbles are formed by a, a central star or group of ionizing stars. And then the material that has been left, that forms the edge of the bubble, that's either there because it's been swept up by that outgoing wave of radiation, or it's simply you know, far enough away that the flux of fo ionizing photons coming from the stars is matched by the density of the material being able to recombine. So that boundary of that bubble is, is where we sometimes see secondary or tertiary generations of stars forming. And uh, I've spent quite a lot of time actually investigating those regions of star formation. Once these high mass stars form, now, now correct me if I'm wrong, a high mass star is something like Betelgeuse, where you just have an enormous, giant, violent, short-lived star, right? Generally speaking, yeah. And that ends in a supernova. Yes. So you're, <laughs> in, in essence, you study suicidal high-mass stars. And now star formation is interesting because it can happen later in the life of a galaxy if it collides with another galaxy. Like, for example, a coming <laughs> collision with the Andromeda galaxy could set off a, another period of star formation in the Milky Way. Well, that, yep, again, that's an interesting question. And uh, I apologize for qualifying all of your questions, but the process of star formation and the efficiency of the star formation, i.e. how big a star you can form from any given star formation event, again, is still a matter of debate. What my work has shown and, and the work of my colleagues has shown is that generally speaking, the more stuff you have, around, and, and by which I mean the dust and the gas, the, the more stars you can form and the larger the stars you will form. So yes, when you get a galactic collision like that, you will be pushing more stuff together and potentially in, then enhancing the star formation. High mass stars um, tend to form somewhat regardless of, of, of the, their location. That It's not completely true that they can form anywhere, but they definitely tend to form where there is more material for them to form from. But yeah, a, a galactic collision would certainly produce the initial conditions necessary to form a further generation of high mass stars. So there's sort of two periods of generation. So you have the early days of a galaxy where it has plenty of material and lots of gas mm -hmm. and dust and everything that can condense down. But if in the course of that galaxy's history, if it collides with another, you can have a second period of star generation. But doesn't that also deplete the two collapsed galaxies or two collided galaxies, rather? Yes. So it, um, there are also that, you know, that that's a broad picture and there are actually more details to that. So, for instance, in the, the picture I was previously describing where you have a high mass star ignite, and ionize its surroundings and potentially uh, propagate a secondary generation of stars close by in the material. So that secondary generation of stars has only so long to try and form before that initial group of stars goes supernova. And then that supernova is likely to remove the material that is accreting onto those secondary stars. So it's an ongoing process um, and it kind of depends what happens to that material. 
when when a supernova occurs, in some ways that seeds the the interstellar medium with higher density materials, and that can lead to further star formation. We're still determining now, you know, what exactly the structure of the Milky Way is, and and how that what form that takes and how that's propagated. I mean, for example, we only really see star formation in and around the spiral arms. And so whether there are processes occurring within that that renews that material and potentially could lead to further generations or not is still an open question. I think, I think galactic collisions is a sort of, on, you know, a meta effect on top of that. So how do you use the Green Bank Telescope to study these? What do you do Specifically, what radio frequencies do you look at to sort of probe the interstellar medium and star formation? Yeah, so a lot of my work has been done using the KFPA, which is the K-band focal plane array. And this is a collection of individual receivers and what we're increasingly calling radio cameras, where we have essentially several receivers put together, much like a multi-pixel camera, like a digital camera or your phone's camera, Obviously, the numbers of pixels are much smaller. In the KFBA's case, we have seven pixels in a sort of hexagonal shape with a, another receiver in the center. We can uh, move that around and scan across the sky and make a full map of, of a portion of the sky. Is While it's still tiny, is is much bigger than we used to be able to do. And, and that enables us to fairly quickly and easily map the centrally condensed collections of dust and gas that are star-forming regions in the case of the KFPA, we're actually looking often at ammonia, which is a molecule that has a particular moment that gives us hyperfine lines that enables us to determine a lot of the physical properties of the gas that we're looking at. So we can determine the temperature of that gas and how dense that gas is, which is obviously very helpful. And there's certain aspects of the ammonia molecule that mean that this transition only occurs in material that's reached a certain density and that's generally associated with star formation. In addition to the ammonia molecule, there are many other molecules. There's water, there's CCS, um, and some other things. The abundances of those chemicals compared to, say, the hydrogen also tells us what's happening in terms of the chemistry of those clouds, whether those things are variable closer into the core or further away from the core. They also allow us to trace what the movement of the gas is like, giving us an indication of what turbulent effects might be happening and what might be causing those turbulent effects. And to take it a step even further, how the gas moves exactly can also tell us something about the magnetic fields that may be supporting these clouds or otherwise. Now, this sounds like a somewhat violent environment that you wouldn't want to navigate a spacecraft through, right? Right. It's it's an interesting environment in that you know, when I was studying for my undergrad, a, a lecturer made the comparison, you know, with, we look at something like a, an H2 region where the, the gas is something like 10,000 Kelvin. Think of that as very, very hot. But in fact, if you were there and were able to survive, you, you would freeze to death because the density is so low. So in terms of navigating a, a spaceship through through these clouds, um, you may not have too much trouble on the outer regions. Depending on where you approach the star, you could be caught by outflow, by other aspects of the turbulence. and. Certainly at the sources of those outflows, there could potentially be very dense material and that, and that could give you some trouble. Can you tell when, when the process sort of flips? In other words, so you've got the secretion of a star and it's forming, but at some point it starts creating solar wind, essentially. Can you pinpoint when that happens, when, when the dust and gas gets blown out? Only statistically, I would say. I mean, of course, we'd have to try and catch that happening. And, and to a certain extent, we can catch that happening. There are there are many sort of projection effects to do with this because, you know, an outflow from a star forming region will begin long before the the solar wind, stellar wind, really erupts and removes all of that material. You know, and by that point, you've you've probably already formed, if not planets, then a, certainly a disk that might be protected by some processes. And it's very hard to say because we've sort of gone from observation at that point to modeling and that there's a gap between those two things that we're still trying to fill what we see in observations is certainly we see outflow so we see material flowing out of poles of the star and we if we look you know really in deep at a very high resolution using say alma 
we see disks around these stars and we're, and we're only just really beginning to see these disks in any great detail and so you know at some point these two things combine and, and a stellar wind truly starts and you are left with a naked star and an h2 region if the star is big enough what i'm not really clear on is whether we have the the numbers of observations to be able to pinpoint when one transitions into the other so this is uh, very much an active area of research now what is a bright rimmed cloud yes so uh, as i was uh, talking about earlier that when a, a high mass star by which i mean a b star or an o star you know does start giving off its stellar wind in a in a sort of that fusion has really kicked in. You ionize a region out to a certain radius that's determined by the density of the surrounding material and the flux of ionizing photons coming from that star. And you are left with this rim of a bubble. Um, and there are secondary generations of stars forming in those rims the edge, at the edges of those bubbles. What is happening in some instances is that the edges of that bubble are still being ionized by the, the photons coming from the, the central star. And that forms a very high temperature, what we call an ionized boundary layer against that, that dense material. And that can then send shocks into the neutral material, potentially causing that secondary generation. There are some famous examples of this. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the Eagle Nebula. Yes. Yes. So that, that is a very good example of a bright and cloud. They're sometimes also called cometary globules for the reason that there's essentially a strong wind blowing against these over densities in the cloud. So the clouds themselves are being eroded away. And much like a dense rock being eroded out of, say, sandstone or something, you know, you're, you're revealing that denser region while the rest of the material is being pushed away. And you get that cometary sort of shape. I mean, they have nothing to do with, you know, what we normally call comets, but they, they have that shape of a head and tail structure. And uh, yeah, so I spend a lot of time studying these bright and clouds, determine if the star formation we see there, and we do see star formation there, but would, I've been trying to determine whether we can show that that star formation would not have occurred otherwise, or even if it would have occurred otherwise, if there's been any effect on the type of star formation due to the acts of that central star ionizing the H2 region. So now the, the the idea of shock waves moving through gas and dust clouds in space, pushing off star formation, what's the mechanism of that? So um, there are a couple of proposed models for that. One is a, a straightforward collect and collapse model where the stellar wind from the ionizing star sweeps up dust and gas, and this then becomes denser and more, you know, uh, and therefore more prone to collapse. Um, what we see in a, a lot of star forming regions is that are actually fairly stable. Um, and we're not always sure what tips a cloud like that over the edge into actually forming a star. We're in a certain state of hydrostatic equilibrium. Now, so that collect and collapse model, you know, would simply condense the material and therefore lead to a higher rate of star formation. There's another model called uh, radiatively driven implosion. Now, as I said before, you, you, you get a, an ionized boundary layer at the edge of the cloud where the photons that are coming from that central star are still acting on the material and ionizing it. And when you ionize the material, you increase the pressure. And that increased pressure, simply by virtue of having lower pre a lower pressure area next to it, um, that leads to shock waves that can cross the cloud. And that may, again, trigger an overdensity of the cloud causing collapse. And then once you've begun that star formation process, then that just carries on from there. This is something we see with radio waves. We can trace that ionized material. Beyond that ionized material, we have a recombination layer where there's enough material there that there, you know, there are molecules bumping into each other and yeah, recombining. We look at the Milky Way and we see that most of it is not high mass stars. It's little tiny red dwarfs, low mass stars. And like the sun, type G, you know, type K, orange dwarfs, things like that. So are there different kinds of star forming regions? In other words, will a certain density produce these huge high mass Betelgeuses? And then another one will just produce a bunch of red dwarfs because it just didn't have that kind of mass. Is, is that how that works? 
Yeah, yeah, that's, that's about right. We see certain regions such as the Perseus molecular cloud tends to form much smaller stars or is currently forming you know, smaller stars there. Whereas um, some of the large regions like W3, these big H2 regions, uh, the Orion Nebula is our closest high mass star forming region. And yes, it, from what we can tell, that's, that's generally the higher density material leading to higher mass stars. Uh, like I said right at the beginning, you know, the more stuff you have, the higher the efficiency of star formation and the higher mass of star you can form. That's really interesting because we could actually say something about life in the universe in that because high mass stars are short lived and not likely to ever form planets or life mm -hmm. or anything like that versus sun like stars forming in less dense regions. So we could actually look at nebulas and say, well, that's a that that one's so dense, it's not likely to ever form life. Could you actually take that step that far? Certainly, you can you can make predictions about where the high mass stars are, have been likely to form in the past. And don't forget that you need a high mass star forming in order to form the metals that would then allow for a second or a third generation of stars to have iron, like a planet like the Earth to have iron and, and so on. Some of these other materials that we need. Certainly in terms of the star formation that's occurring now, if we look in the outer galaxy, we see far fewer H2 regions. And that, again, it, it's down to the, the fact that the, the galaxy is denser towards the center. But then also you've got to take into account the fact that the spiral arms are denser than elsewhere. Now, my last question for you is, do we have any idea how many stars are occurring? Let's, let's say occurring, forming slowly or rapidly, whatever they do, whatever sparks them off. How often does that, does that happen in the Milky Way? I mean, is there a chance that we could catch a star in one of these these regions in the act of, of turning on? Yes, yep. Um, we see H2 regions. In, we, we are in the process now of mapping the H2 regions throughout the, the galaxy. And actually this is a, a project I'm, I'm working towards getting underway where we, we, we started with the, uh, the knowledge of these H2 regions where a new high mass star is formed and ionized material around it. And we moved from there to compact H2 regions, which was more or less the same thing, but at, that, at a smaller size and it's still expanding. And we've gone from that to um, hyper compact H2 regions and ultra compact H2 regions. I may have got the order of those mixed up. So we are tracing these back to an earlier and earlier phase. There's still very few of those um, hypercompact H2 regions known. You know, we're, we're down in uh, it's double digits uh, still. So we're, we're still um, trying to really establish what the population of the galaxy is in terms of um, that very earliest stage of star formation. And between every phase of star formation, there, there's some kind of gap. We, we think we've begun to identify the earliest stages of where high mass stars form, and those are infrared dark clouds. But we really don't know how long those have been sat around before they start to form. And once they do start to form, then, you know, we, we have this hyper compact H2 region, but we're still very much in the, I wouldn't say the early stages, but the, the middling stages of identifying where one becomes the other. In terms of how many stars are actually forming in the Milky Way, very approximate figure is something like a solar mass per year is being formed out there. And so even though we might see a region that is forming hundreds of solar masses, you know, that, that also takes tens of thousands of years to fully form. So it all kind of gets averaged out. Something we, we have been doing is, is actually more efficiently tracing the efficiency of star formation throughout the galaxy. And we've been able to see that certain regions are more efficient than others. So we can say that, you know, some, somewhere like W43, which is a super bright um, H2 region, um, you know, has a lot of star formation going on there. It's very efficient because that's where all the stuff is. Um, and then towards the outer galaxy, there's sort of far less happening. But uh, that is also helping us understand the structure of the Milky Way and perhaps giving us insights into uh, where that material has come from and where material is moving to. Building a picture of the birth of giant stars. That's absolutely amazing. All right, Doctor, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate it and I wish you great luck at the Green Bank Telescope. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction John, Author. Wrong channel. No, it's not. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction Author John Michael Godier, currently hosting Event Horizon and wondering where Anna actually came from. One day I had a tablet computer, the next I had a boss. Very disturbing. Be sure.
And that's enough of that. YouTuber forever! Like, subscribe, and hit the bell! Sell out. What? <laughs>